God does not forgive men in installments. His forgiveness is once and for all. And that is what he's talking about, being free from penalties. You are not a candidate to receive punishment for your sins. Why? Because God is righteous and he is just. And in his righteousness and his legality as a legal God cannot punish the same sin twice. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow. What a beautiful day this is that we are here again to fellowship with the word of God. And it's beautiful to have all of you tuned in. And even if you have tuned in maybe later, we thank God that you found time. This is always the Marvelous Believer Show on Wema TV. This is where we learn who we are in Christ, what we are in Christ, and what Christ has done for us. We cannot take less. We cannot take no for an answer when we know who we have become in Christ. And so as we continue fellowshipping with the word, I know you are going to be blessed. I will be blessed. And I want to encourage you, tag someone, bring someone along so that we are blessed together. Don't let a loved one miss this a message for anything. Just make sure you tag them and they will thank you later. This is a life-changing message. And because today I am not alone in the studio, uh, I am so excited that I am with a, a friend and a colleague, a pastor that I fellowship with, a pastor that I have known as a teacher of the word. That's why I'm excited because I know it is going to be fire for fire. It goes deeper and deeper every time. Uh, this is Pastor Ben Fetcher. Thank you so much for finding time to be here you, and uh, to come and even fellowship with us. Indeed. And the last time it was so exciting, we went quite far. Yeah. And so I want to allow you to take over so that we continue. Thank you so much, Pastor Lucy. Uh, it's an honor to be hosted again here at uh, the Marvelous Believers show. And uh, I'll, just like you say, that is this is a place where people get enlightened and get to know who they are in Christ. For you to be a marvelous believer, you have to be established in the knowledge of Christ. You have to be established in who you are in Christ Jesus so that you'll be rooted and built up in your identity. Uh, I remember in our last episode when I was here, we said that we have been completely forgiven. And uh, you realize that in our day-to-day -day life, if there is something that bothers men and bothers human beings, let me say bothers everyone that is in this world, is the issue of their sins. And uh, that is the issue that is mostly talked about even in our churches, in our fellowships. Wherever people gather and they tend to fellowship or to, to talk about God, the first thing that comes to the table as a point of discussion is what about our sins. So. Uh, most people are talking about how they can handle their sins, how they can overcome their sins, how can they can how they can manage their sins, or even how God can deal with their sins. But it is also evident that one of the major things that has been dealt with with a lot of carefulness and with a lot of finality in the in the Bible is the issue of sin. Why? Because because the issue of sin is what separated man from God. God has always been a God who loves fellowshipping with man. God always enjoy uh, having good relationship with man. But the greatest hindrance to the fellowship of man and God, the union of man and God, is the issue of sin. And because before sin became a problem to man, it was a problem to God. In other words, before you began getting bothered by your sins, your mistakes, and your shortcomings, it bothered God even before you were born. And that is why he realized that you and I, that, has, that is as human beings, since the days of Adam, since the day that sin entered into the world, I remember we said in our last episode that uh, it is through Adam that sin entered the world. So when sin entered the world, the first one who was to be bothered by sin was not man. The first one to be bothered by sin was God himself. That is why when he came to the Garden of Aden, he asked man, where are you? Because uh, man had hidden himself and he had fallen short of the glory of God. So man said that he was, he realized that he was naked. The first question that God asked after that was, 
who told you that you are naked? Then God provided a way out to cover his nakedness. That is to say, God provided a solution for the issue of sin, though in the Garden of Eden he did it in, in form of a picture, a symbol, or he was pointing towards what he will ultimately do as the ultimate solution for sin. So the one who came up with a solution for sin was not man, but God. So the issue of sin should not be an issue to bother man. Though it is through man that sin entered into the world, the way that sin can leave the world, the solution is only found in God. Praise God. That is why... One of the common verses that you and I really love is in the book of John chapter 3 verse 16 where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Praise God. So by that he was saying that the only solution and the only way for man to come back to the relationship with God, where God lives in the eternal realm, where God lives in the relation uh, in everlasting life, the only way is by God giving his son. So it is God who provides the solution for sin, not man. So a time has come when everyone in the world should be told that stop looking for how to solve the issue of your sin. Stop looking for ways to handle your sin sins because people have come up with so many ways others they offer sacrifices others give some lump sum or amount of money trying to deal with their sins but the solution for your sin is not within you neither is it within your abilities it is within God's abilities and I remember we read in the book of first John chapter 1 verse 9 one of the most uh, interesting verses that is talked about in the book of first John chapter 1 verse 9 where we saw I Apostle John saying that if we say that we don't have sin, we are lying. But verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we established that when we believed, when we accepted and acknowledged that we are sinners, God cleansed us from all and righteousness. So we said we are completely forgiven. And the greatest barrier, the greatest hindrance between the relationship of God and man was sin. So God offered a, an eternal or an, a, a, an everlasting solution for sin. So the issue of sin should not be the point of the discussion of believers. Praise God. But you realize that every religion finds its foundation on sin. But if sin is removed from the table and becomes not the point of our discussion, then you kill all religion. Because the aspect of religion is how to overcome your sin, how to deal with your sin, how your sin will either take you to hell or how your sinlessness will take you to heaven. So if you remove the issue of sin, then religion has nothing to drive on. Praise God. Because religion thrives on sin. Hallelujah. That is why you have some religion says, uh, saying that if your good works in the, in the balance, if your good works in, are more than your bad works, then you go to live with God. If your bad works in, are more than your good works, then you go to hell. Praise God. But that is not the way God solved the issue of sin. And that is how we saw that when we believed in him and we acknowledged that we were sinners, we were cleansed from all unrighteousness. And now I want us to go to another verse in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. And I will read from different translations. And I want to show you again how completely forgiven you are. He says... In uh, verse 7, in him we have redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something interesting about these verses is that you say you should start from verse 7. Then you realize that verse 6 is <laughs> equally important. Verse 5, you end up going to verse 3. Yes, and you should start from verse number 3. If Pastor, you allow me. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So he is establishing us and telling us what has happened 
to us. Just as he chose us, so he chose us. We are already chosen in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy. You know, most people think like the opposite of sinfulness is holiness. But that is not the opposite of sinfulness. The opposite of, si of uh, holiness does not mean sin sinlessness. Holiness means uh, being set apart, being, sec uh, being set apart, being uh, secluded, being uh, set apart for God for a particular uh, reason. Praise God. So he has made us holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by whom by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now we can take it, uh, take verse 7 from there. Verse 7 says, In him, now in Christ, that is the beloved, we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That verse has uh, two commas. Using the, the original rendering, that is the King James says, in him we have redemption through his blood, comma, the forgiveness of sins, comma, according to the riches of his grace. Again, it does not end with a full stop. It continues uh, with verse 8. But before I go to verse 8, I want to show you what this means. He says we have redemption through his blood. Redemption means we have been redeemed. We have been bought to the price. We have been bought. You know, we were in the market. Uh, we were slaves. We were slaves in the. Uh, we were in the slave market as slaves. But God bought us back. He redeemed us. The Bible. The word redeem means to pay the price and to buy back. So we have been bought back into the family of God. We have been redeemed, and this is through His blood. Then he says the forgiveness of sins. So when he's talking about redemption, redemption means forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. So forgiveness of sins is redemption. And then he says according to the riches of his grace. So this forgiveness of sins is not according to you. It's not according to Someone said it is not according to the poverty of your confession. Because if you are to confess your sins, how many of them do you remember? How many of them do you remember? So you'll be poor in your confession. So forgiveness of sins is not attached to your confession of sins. Forgiveness of sins is according to the riches of his grace. So in other words, he's saying... If you are able to measure and to count how rich God is in his grace, then you'll be able to understand how forgiven you are. Are we together? I believe we are together. Then I want to read the same verse 7 using the message Bible. The same verse 7 using the message Bible. He says, because of the sacrifice of, of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We are a free people. So when we talk about forgiveness and uh, when we talk about redemption, it means we have been bought with a price. We have been bought by God. So we are no longer in the market of slavery to sin. We have been bought by God. Then he says we are free people. Free, number one, of penalties and punishments chalked upon uh, choked up by all our misdeeds. So he's saying that we are free from punishment. So what does that mean? That forgiveness of sins means that you have been set free. You don't, uh, you will not receive punishment for your sins. Why? Because the only punishment that is due, the legal punishment for sin is not a uh, uh, it, it's not beating up yourself and saying I'm a sinner. The legal punishment for sins is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So if you want to, you know, those people who are very serious about sins, they tend to, to say that if 
I have to be forgiven by God. I have to take the issue of sin seriously. Then I have to keep repenting and confessing. They confuse repentance and confession. So they say I have to keep every night before I sleep. I have to keep my short accounts. You know my short accounts. Today I have sinned. So I have to keep some short accounts. What I have done today I have to confess them. So they think like God forgives them in with short accounts or in installments. But I'm here to tell you that God's forgiveness, God does not forgive, forgive us in installments because God is not an ATM machine where you withdraw by installments. You withdraw today, you withdraw tomorrow. No, 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 no. The forgiveness of sins is something that has happened once. And he says, this forgiveness of sins renders us free from penalties. I say the wages of sin is death. And that is to say that the only way you can show up if you are truly, truly, uh, truly, truly serious about your sins, the only way to deal with that is not by beating your chest and saying I'm a sinner and telling God now forgive me, I have stolen, I have done this and this, the sins of omission and the sins of commission. Anyone who is serious about their sins will know that that is not the way to pay for your sins. The way to pay for your sins is to show up dead. Show up in a casket, <laughs> show up dead. But again, not just showing up dead, but also your blood must qualify to cleanse you from your sins. So instead of all that hassle, God in his love sent his son and he died for us. So anyone who is serious about their sins can only focus on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. It is not about your confession. It's not about you keeping short accounts with God. God is not interested with your short accounts. Like in the evening before you sleep, you keep your short accounts. You tell him, in the, uh, today I did this and this and this, so forgive me. No, 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 no. God does not forgive men in installments. His forgiveness is once and for all. And that is what he's talking about, being free from penalties. So God will not and he will never punish you for your sins. I know this is not the common gospel, but this is the truth. God will never punish you for your sins. Why? Because Jesus received the capital punishment for sins. What is the capital punishment for sin? Death. He died for you. So if Jesus received the capital punishment for, for sin, which is death, you are not uh, you are not a candidate to receive punishment for your sins. Why? Because God is righteous and he is just and in his righteousness and his legality as a legal God cannot punish the same sin twice. So if it was punished on Christ, it cannot be punished on you. That is why I usually preach the good news and tell people you don't have to suffer in hell. Why? Because Jesus went to hell on your behalf so that you will not have a reason to go to hell. Actually, there is no human being on this planet. There is no human being has a reason why he should go to hell. Why? Because Jesus paid for you. Jesus paid the price for you. But if you insist on what you can do, if you insist on how you should keep short accounts, you are saying that, Jesus, you did not do enough. I can do something more on that and I can make myself a candidate of heaven. But that is not the truth. So we should believe. That is why the gospel is about believing. So whether it is making sense to your mind or not, it's about believing. And this is why I usually say that, Anytime you listen to a message and it, don't, it doesn't leave you at a point of believing, that mes message is questionable. Because the message of the gospel must leave the hearers to the point of believing. Actually, that is the essence of the gospel. That is why Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or by the word of God. So any gospel that does not leave you at a point of believing, but leave you at a point where you are supposed to pick up tools and try to work hard to achieve to the levels and the standards of God, that is not the gospel. So that is why I'm telling you, your sins have been fully forgiven. So what are you supposed to, to do? Or what is your response? Believe, just believe that your sins have been forgiven. And your, the, the, the punishment for your sins have been taken once and for all by our Lord 
and Savior Jesus Christ. And God is just. He cannot punish the same sin twice. So you just need to believe. Then the message continues and says, and not just barely free, either abundantly free. We are not just barely free, but we are abundantly free. In other words, we are free and we have also been given abundance of the Christ's life. Praise God. And that is the working of God's grace. That is beyond what mercy can do. Mercy only uh, takes what belongs to you and, uh, and protects you from receiving what you deserve. But grace, not, just, uh, not only does it give and not only does it take, it, uh, take away what belongs to you, but it takes away what you deserved and gives you much more. Praise God. So the death of Jesus uh, left us at the, at the place of God's mercy that we were supposed to die for our sins, but someone else has died for us. But the resurrection of Christ now brought us to the place of God's resurrection, the place of God's grace, where we are not left helpless, we are not forgiven sinners, but we have been forgiven and above all, we have been made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. If Jesus only died for our sins and never rose from the dead, we could be sinners who have been forgiven and given another a blank check to fill in. But Jesus not only did he die, but he died and rose again from the dead. So through his death, we were forgiven, but through his resurrection, we were made righteous. So that is what he means by abundantly free. So we are not just free from sins, but we are free and we have been made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. This is, this is so nice. Then the Bible says, abundantly free. He thought of everything. Now listen to this keenly. He thought of everything, that is God, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. So he thought of everything. What does that mean? He's, that means that um, he loved us and he wanted us to be separated or to die to sin, to be separated from to be separated from sin. So he thought of everything. Then he provided for everything we could possibly need. So if he only forgave us of our sins, that could not be enough. So above and over and above forgiveness, he gave us everything we could possibly need. That is, he gave us his very own righteousness. So that is to say that we are eternally forgiven. And above that, we are the righteousness of God. Above being forgiven, we have been made a new creation. A new creation means a new kind of a man that never existed. So, so we can actually say this, that the, part, the man who was, forgiven, who was forgiven, he was forgiven and a new man was raised. Now, we are not just the forgiven, we are the new creation. We have been made the righteousness of of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. So he brought us and made us partakers of the plan that he had from the beginning. What was God's plan from the beginning? That man should come into union with God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So in the spiritual, God saw the heavens and the earth united or in union, because creation talks about uh, uh, creation talks about the spirit. So, in the beginning, what God saw from the beginning was the union of the heaven and the earth. That is the union of the man who is on earth with the man in heaven. So, so now heaven and earth becomes one. So God has brought us into this plan that he took delight in making. Praise God. That, uh, now that means that we are one with God. Then he said, then he says, he set it all out before us in Christ, a long range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. Everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth. 
Now verse 11 says, it is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. <laughs> Praise God. He had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. So it is in Christ that you, once, be, once you had the truth and believed, and believed it, this message of your salvation, found yourselves home, free, now we are home, and this is how, how he describes us at home. We are home, free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. And this signet from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. I hope now you can see it, that now where we are, we have been moved from the courtroom. It is in the courtroom where mistakes are discussed, where judgment is made. But we have been moved from the courtroom and we have been brought into the family. Hallelujah. You are no longer in the courtroom of God. You that believe, you have been brought into the family of God. And when we are in the family, that means now we are not strangers to God. We are not foreigners. We are no longer sinners. We have been made sons of God. Praise be to God. And if you've been made sons of God, then we are heirs with God. This is where we've been brought. The Bible says that we have passed from death to life. We have passed from judgment to life. Praise be to God. This is where we belong, where we have been uh, uh, completely forgiven. And this is what we call eternal redemption. So what does that usher us into? That ushers us into a place where, where we are eternally secure in Christ. If there is something that make, uh, make people question about their salvation, it's because they don't know what God has done concerning their sins. Now you know it, that God has dealt with your sins. Uh, with a point of finality and a note of finality. And now the issue of sin is not the point of discussion today. You have passed from the courtroom. The people who are not in the courtroom cannot discuss sins any longer. We have passed from that. Praise God. And as uh, uh, I, I'll read another verse in the book of uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 uh, verse number, from verse number 1. Romans chapter 6 from verse number 1. We are still talking about how forgiven you are and how safe now you are in Christ. He says, I'm reading again using the message translation. Romans chapter 6 verse 1. He says, so what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left, now listen, if we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? This is how God dealt with the issue of sin. It was a transfer. It was a shifting. God caused you to leave the country where sin is sovereign. So you're no longer in the nation. You're no longer in the world where sin rules. Sovereign means sin is the master. Now you have been delivered. You have been shifted. You have been brought into a new environment, the, a new country where sin is not the king. He says, all didn't, okay, uh, still live. Okay, if we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? So when you believed, you left that house. And as we conclude, all didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good. This is the good news about every believer. If you believe in Christ, you packed and left the world of sin. That is why he says we have passed from death unto life. Now you don't belong to the courtroom. You belong to the family. And what the father has belongs to you. The Bible says that now we are joint heirs with Christ. So stop worrying about your sins. Stop discussing the issue of your sins. God is not even interested in such a conversation because when you bring up that conversation with God, he is like, no, you know what, dude, I completed and finished with the issue of sin. Don't bring it back to me because I have finished with it. So uh, it is finished. 
Let also your mind recall that it is finished. And now you belong to the family of God as a son of God. So thank you so much. You are blessed. Amen. Hey, wow. Wow. Thank you so much. It is finished. Is finished. The issue of sin is done with. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. You have had it all for yourself. The issue of sin was dealt with by God himself. And like pastor has said, there is no sin that can be paid twice. The debt was paid. The sin was paid for. For you, it is to accept the free gift of salvation. We always say salvation is not free. It was paid for. And, that, and like he has said, Jesus paid for it. And you already paid. Whether you have accepted it or not, it was paid for. In case you're listening to us and you have never accepted the free gift of salvation, it was paid for and for you. Just come and enter in the rest of knowing that God has called you to an eternal redemption. So we thank God for that teaching. Uh, I believe... I believe you are blessed. You can let us know. You can put a comment there. I believe you are blessed. I have also been blessed and refreshed even to hear that how eternally, how conclusively God dealt with the issue of sin. It is always very encouraging to see all of us here fellowshipping with us. Let's continue sharing this message with as many people as we can. And uh, thank you again for tuning in. This is the Marvelous Believers Show on Wema TV. You are blessed. Amen.